Uh, today we are kicking uh, off the second part of a relationship series that we started last week. Now, this is an important series because relationships matter. And uh, if you weren't here last week, we started off by, I did a little bit of a, of a poll to get some data. And the data overwhelmingly showed that we all have problems in our relationships, everybody. We all have issues. And that's why the series matters, because we all have relationships and we all have problems in our relationships. And there are some principles, there are some things that we can do to make relationships better. And, you know, I don't know about you, but I have yet to meet somebody who would say, you know, I don't want my relationships to get any better. None. Zero. Like, I'm good. Don't need anything better. I've never met somebody who would say that. I've met lots of people who would say, like, well, I'm pretty content in them. But, like, if you really push and say, yeah, but are there any that you wish would be just a little better? Like, everybody says yes. There's some relationship somewhere in our lives that we wish was a little bit better. And so that's what this series is all about. How do we do, how do we build strong foundations for healthy relationships? Now, each week, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at a specific topic that, uh, that is important in relationships. And I'm going to try to answer two questions. One is, why does this particular thing matter so much? And then secondly, how do we do this thing in a biblically healthy way? I don't just want to give us principles that help make it better. I want to give us biblical principles. Here's, here's what I believe fundamentally about relationships. God created us. He wired us. He, he, God knows people best. And so that also means that then he understands the way that we work best. He, he understands the ways that relationships are the smoothest, the ways that they're the most full of life. He understands the dynamics because he's the one that created the dynamics. And so it's, I don't think it's, it's not enough to just understand kind of common knowledge about relationships. I think we need to know what does God say about how to do relationships in a healthy way. So that's where we're going. Um, a little bit of a roadmap. Uh, last week, we talked about communication. Why does communication matter? Why does healthy communication matter? How do we, how do we communicate in a healthy way, uh, in a biblically healthy way? If you missed that, you can always catch up on YouTube or on our website. Uh, next week, again, as a reminder, is Fifth Sunday, so we won't have a message. Like, there's no music, there's no sermon, there's nothing like that next week. We'll gather here, uh, we'll talk a little bit about our project, and then we'll just go serve people. Um, and then we'll pick back up the series in two weeks on May 7th by talking about boundaries. Are boundaries biblical? Is it, is it good to establish boundaries in our relationships? Spoiler alert, yes. Uh, and then on Mother's Day, on May the 14th, we're going to talk about forgiveness, which will be really good. So today we are talking about conflict. Conflict. Anybody have conflict ever in their lives? Anybody? No? Some loud laughs at that. Um, conflict, is a, conflict is an interesting and a funny thing. Uh, relationships are hard fundamentally because of conflict. Like, at the end of the day, for all of us, th th there's an interesting problem that I think happens when we talk about conflict. My suspicion is that all of us immediately in our mind get some sort of an image that is negative in nature. I might be wrong, there might be somebody that doesn't, but probably for all of us, we get an image in our mind immediately of some situation, something that happened, uh, some, some relationship problem that is negative in nature. Conflict is a word that has a negative connotation because for most of us, probably for all of us, our relationships, probably relationships at times that we really cared about, had a lot of conflict, and at some point in time, we had a relationship ruined or we had a relationship go bad because of conflict. And so there's a very negative association, even with the word, I think for a lot of us. Now, as I was thinking about, as I was thinking about conflict, um, I, again, I, I think that for all of us, the problem primarily when we start to talk about conflict is that we see it as the primary source of ruined relationships and pain. I think most of us see conflict as the primary cause of ruined relationships and pain. And as a result of that, we tend to take one of three uh, kind of stances toward conflict. I'm not going to make you raise your hands, but I do want to ask you to self-identify which one of these you most identify with. So for some of us, I think we take the approach toward conflict. And by the way, I think this is all very subconscious. It kind of happens before we realize it. But some of us are aggressors. We're aggressors. We kind of like conflict. And we like to create it. And we like to be in it. We like to watch it. We're the bear pokers. 
I'm a bear poker. Anybody a bear poker? I'm a bear poker. I love poking the bear. It's great. It's not everybody agrees with me, as the very limited amount of laughter would suggest. <laughs> some of us are bear pokers. We're aggressors. Now, I think, and we've got some, uh, we've got a couple of uh, mental health professionals in the room who might disagree, and if they do, I hope that they will tell me that I was wrong about this afterward, but... Um, I think it seems to me like people who tend to be aggressors in conflict, I think there is something a little bit different built into those of us that are kind of that way. But I also think that a part of that is a way to control the conflict. I think there's a bit of a subconscious dynamic at work where we know that, uh, I know that like if I can take the aggressor role in the conflict, I can control how the conflict works. And so I can protect myself by nature There's a second group of people in the way that they handle conflict, and I would call those maybe the defenders. Not necessarily people who are going to, like, create conflict per se, but people who, as soon as as there is conflict, they're going to immediately jump to be defensive. And again, I think all these are probably protection mechanisms in some way, right? Like, a defender is naturally going to try to protect themselves from feeling pain by saying, but no, I didn't, no, that that isn't what I, so the aggressor is going to say, you, 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 the defender is going to say, no, I, I, I. Didn't, didn't, I I didn't do that. I, and then the third group of people, which we all fall into at certain points in time, but some of us are exceptionally great at this. I would call the avoiders. Any avoiders? It's like, I'm not, conflict is not real. My son, my, my middle uh, Mason is, uh, he's really funny for his whole life. If he's been scared of anything, uh, he freezes like, I mean, the first time that the first time that he um, didn't have like baby spit up, like vomited, right? The first time he ever did it, um, we knew something was wrong because he got very, 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 very still, and he didn't move. Like I'm gonna will it away. <laughs> and then it happened. And then as soon as it happened, he just he he kind of went to play in and we had him in the bathtub and he kind of went to play in and and then about five minutes later he's playing he's playing he's playing and he just went (laughs) and he just sat there stone cold still until it happened again like that's just that's mason he's a like he's stoic right my dad was a little bit this way my dad um not a little bit my dad was a lot this way if there was conflict dad just he what is like not not doing conflict any avoiders? Some, some of us are avoiders. So attackers, defenders, avoiders. Again, there might be some other buckets. There might be other, other types, but that's what I see a lot. I see people who are kind of aggressive, people who tend to defend, and people who try to avoid. Aggressors, I think, try to control conflict. Defenders try to protect themselves against the conflict. And avoiders, I think, try to prevent conflict altogether. In all three cases, I think what's happening is that what we're trying to do very subconsciously is prevent broken relationships or pain. That's the goal. We're trying to prevent broken relationships or pain. Now, I said that each week we're going to talk about why this matters. And so I, I, want, to, I want to give, a, a, I want to ask a question that then I'm going to spend the rest of the morning trying to unpack a little bit of what I think the answer to the question is. The, the question is, what if those three, um, again, in, in my experience, the three most common responses to conflict, what if those, all three of those responses actually create the problem that they're trying to solve? What if what we're doing subconsciously and how we respond to conflict is actually creating the problem that we're trying to eliminate? So what if being an aggressor, being a defender, or being an avoider, if any of those scenarios, what if those are actually fundamentally unhealthy behaviors and are actually creating the biggest problems that we can experience with conflict? I want to lay out for you why I think that the answer to that question or why I think that that is true. We're going to look to scripture for that. We're going to start off uh, in the book of Exodus. And I want to show you an example of a person who handles a, a difficult or a potentially difficult situation in a really healthy way. So for some context, we've got two main characters in this story. We've got a guy named Jethro and a guy named Moses. Now, if you're familiar with the Bible, Moses might be a familiar name. Jethro may not be. If you're not familiar with the Bible, Moses uh, is one of the most important figures in the Bible. He's a guy who uh, the nation of Israel, God's chosen people, uh, were, were enslaved in Egypt for about 400 years. And then God rose up a leader, a guy named Moses, 
to go and kind of be his instrument to, uh, to, to set the people of Israel free and to lead them through this long journey in, in the desert, uh, in the Sinai Peninsula, and then to eventually get them to the land that God had promised Moses' ancestors many, many years before. And so Moses goes to Egypt. He kind of convinces Pharaoh, that's a long story, kind of convinces Pharaoh to let the people go. He leads the people, he's leading people through the desert toward the promised land. It's in that context that we meet Jethro. Jethro is Moses' father-in-law. And some of you immediately are like, oh, there's conflict. The rest of you are like, I can't laugh because my spouse is sitting next to me and I can't let them know what I think. Um, No, so what we actually find is that Moses has a great relationship with his father-in-law. It's a healthy relationship. The conflict isn't between the two of them. But as Moses is leading people through the wilderness, Jethro is actually a priest uh, of a tribe called Midian. So Jethro isn't a part of the nation of Israel. Moses met uh, his wife Zipporah uh, in a time where he wasn't with the nation of Israel. So Moses is leading the people. Uh, there's th- this whole, like, the, all these people got free from Egypt. It, it was like it had become news around the ancient Near East at the time. People had heard about it. All the tribes had heard. There's now this, this, this people group that's, like, migrating through this area. Jethro begins to hear the stories of, of battles that the nation of Israel is winning, and, and he's, he's hearing news about all that Moses is doing. So he goes to visit Moses. And as he does... He begins to observe what Moses is doing, how he's leading the nation of Israel. And as he's watching, he begins to see some things that to him are concerning. We're going to pick up the story there in Exodus chapter 18, starting in verse 17. It says, Moses' father-in-law replied, what you're doing is not good. You and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. The work is too heavy for you. You cannot handle it alone. So pause. Very quickly, what's happening is Moses is serving as the judge of the nation of Israel. Now, that is similar to the way you might think of a judge now. One of Moses' primary responsibilities at this point in time was every day he would go sit in this particular seat in this particular tent, and people would come with all their gripes and their complaints about everything that everybody was doing wrong to him. Moses would listen, and then he would render a judgment or a verdict on what needed to happen to maintain peace and harmony throughout the nation of Israel. That sounds like a terrible job. Sounds awful. But this is Moses' job at this point. The problem, as Jethro is identifying, is there's too many problems, and there's too many people, and Moses can't handle it all. There's just no way that it's sustainable. Jethro, as an older, wiser man, sees it and immediately goes, this isn't going to work. And so Jethro has the option here. He can either just stand back and kind of watch Moses implode, or he can create conflict and go to Moses and say exactly what he said. Hey, what you're doing isn't good. Now he continues. He says, listen to me now and I'll give you some advice and may God be with you. You must be the people's representative before God and bring their disputes to him. Teach them his decrees and instructions and show them the way they're to live and how they are to behave. So he says, like, keep doing what you're doing, but you need to do something different too. You need to select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain. It's like people of character and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. He says, build some structure, man. If you don't create some structure here, this isn't going to work. He says, have them serve as judges for the people at all times, but have them bring very difficult cases to you. The simple cases, they can decide themselves. That will make your load lighter because they will share it with you. If you do this and God so commands, you will be able to stand the strain and all these people will go home satisfied. Now, this is seemingly a kind of a random piece of this narrative set in the story. What we find out as the narrative continues is that Moses listens to Jethro. He does what Jethro thinks is going to work, and it, it does. It works, it works well. What we also learn is that almost immediately following this conversation, Jethro goes home. So Jethro shows up, observes Moses, goes, hey, man, you're doing this wrong. Here's how you need to do it. Peace out. I don't know about you. I don't know about your relationship with your in-laws. I would not be thrilled 
If that was the approach my father-in-law took toward telling me how to change much of anything, I wouldn't be thrilled if that was the approach that anybody took toward telling me how to do anything. Now, listen, within the narrative, it wasn't quite that drastic, but here's the point. Jethro gained nothing by having this conversation with Moses. Zilch. I mean, nothing. He showed up. He observed. He's like, this ain't going to work, man. Do it different. Now it's time for me to go home. Jethro wasn't part of the nation of Israel. The way that Moses was leading didn't impact Jethro on a personal level at all. Jethro went home to the Midianites where he was a priest, and his life was completely unaffected by what Moses did or did not do with his advice. Jethro chose to create conflict in a situation that didn't benefit him one bit. Why? That's the question. Why? Why would he do this? I think, I think that it's because Jethro understood a principle that is later laid out in the Bible in the book of Proverbs that we actually read last week and spent a little bit of time talking about, but that we're going to go a little deeper on today. It's uh, one of my very favorite verses in the Bible. It's something that I have lived by for as long as I can remember knowing it, years and years and years. But it's a very challenging, challenging verse. We're going to break it down in two parts. And we're going to answer the question, why does, healthy con- why does conflict matter so much? As we read this, I want you to keep in mind this story of Jethro and what he did. Here's what Proverbs 27 says. Wounds from a friend can be trusted. That's the first part. We're going to pause there. Wounds from a friend can be trusted. We think of wounds, I, well, I, I shouldn't speak for you. My suspicion is that we think of wounds as bad similar to conflict. There's a very subconscious, visceral, kind of natural response where we hear the word wound and we think wound bad. Wound bad. But the truth is that sometimes wounds are fundamentally good. Wounds are not necessarily always bad. Sometimes wounds are good. I, uh, I'm in the process of... Um, planting uh, a garden. My, my dad, uh, he loved to garden. He kept a pretty decent sized vegetable garden every year. And uh, when he passed a couple of years ago, uh, one of the things I just, I, I wanted to try to do was I wanted to try to take over his garden and not just let it die. I am not the gardener my dad was. Um, and as I mentioned a few minutes ago, dad didn't like conflict. Well, the problem was that as a teenager, I liked conflict a lot. And uh, so if dad asked me to do much of anything, I would yip and argue and be a pain in his butt. And so he just didn't ask me to help him with anything uh, because he's an avoider. Well, that means that I didn't learn to garden because like, I didn't want to be out digging in the dirt as a teenager. I just didn't. I wanted to be sitting inside doing nothing. So I regret that now. <laughs> but point is, I'm starting to work on getting the garden going. Uh, a couple of the plants that I like to grow are cucumbers and tomatoes. And uh, there's different theories and philosophies about how to do this. Dad was just kind of, let him go. That was, that was his uh, theory. I've taken a different approach. Uh, I prune those plants a lot. Now, if you're familiar with pruning, the idea is that you intentionally damage the plant. You intentionally remove parts of the plant to promote health toward the part of the plant that you didn't remove. Does that make sense? So with a cucumber, there's a vine that grows and there's a little node every few inches and those nodes turn into a new vine and each new vine can have nodes that turn into new vines. Well, if you let that just go, it first of all will like take over your garden, but second of all, every one of those vines is gonna produce fruit and so there's all the nutrients from the root system have to go to all the fruit. And so it gets dispersed where if you break off some of the nodes strategically, it the vines won't grow and more nutrition gets to the fruit. Does, it, does that make sense? So I'm, I'm breaking off, I'm tearing off, I'm wounding the plants in a very literal sense in order to promote growth in other parts of the plant. Another way to think about this would be um, a couple months ago, my, my daughter uh, broke her arm. And uh, when, when we took her to the hospital, they had to, hers was not quite bad enough, they had to do surgery. But they did have to put her under, they gave her some general anesthesia, put her under, and then they reset the bone externally. Well, if you break a bone badly enough, you have to have surgery. What does surgery involve? A pretty significant wound. Why? So that you can get in and do the work that needs to be done for long-term healing to take place. 
There is a very real scenario in which a very real and literal wound is not only beneficial, but necessary for long-term health and growth. Wounds from a friend can be trusted. The reason why conflict matters so much is if we understand this principle, if we understand why Jethro did what he did, I think it's because of this. Jethro understood that healthy conflict fuels trust and growth. Healthy conflict, that's key, healthy conflict. Healthy conflict fuels trust and growth. Healthy conflict fuels trust and growth. In my life, Healthy conflict has been the primary source of my personal health, the health of the relationships that I hold closest. It's also been the source of the deepest trust in those relationships. I'm going to talk more about that in a moment, but I use those words very purposefully. I think back to several different examples. My, my youth pastor growing up um, was a guy named Steve. And uh, Steve was a, was a great guy. And Steve was not the most serious guy in the world, which is part of why I liked him. Um, I, I'll never forget there was a conversation that he and I had. I was probably 15 or 16 years old. And um, I didn't know it at the time, but in retrospect, I was, I was a fairly wounded teenager. I've talked about it before, but I was bullied pretty hard through middle school and high school at school. And... So I, I never felt at home in my school, but within my church, I felt at home. I felt safe. I felt secure. I felt like I was loved. And um, I, I was seen as important there in a way that I wasn't at school. Um, but ha- so, some of you know this. I tell my kids this all the time. Hurt people hurt people. You know that? Hurt people hurt people. And as a teenager in particular, uh, I, 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 would j- I would joke a lot with people, like making fun of them. At, within my church context. And it was always joking, but like, eh, you know, it never makes people feel good. And I just kind of like cut on them and make jokes about them and things like that. And I'll never forget, again, I was like 15 or 16 and Steve pulled me into his office one day and he looked me in the face. He was like, man, you got to quit ripping on people. And I was like, well, what do you, what do you mean? Like, you got to quit, man. Like, it's not as funny as you think it is. And it certainly doesn't feel good to those people. I was like, Okay. Well, I was 15 or 16, so that went marginally well at best. But that conversation has carried through my life. God has reminded me of that conversation many times. That was, to be real honest, in that moment, that was a strong wound from somebody that I trusted. But it was a wound that I needed. I think about conversations with, um, uh, I think about a conversation with my dad one time as a teenager who, again, my dad was not a person who liked conflict. Um, we were driving one day, and um, I've never been one that takes like, life especially seriously. So uh, I remember dad telling me one day, he was like, Andrew, you got to quit screwing around. Like, you got to start to take some things seriously, especially schoolwork. Okay, dad, like, I get good grades. He's like, yeah, you get good grades, but like, you don't try. And if you don't get that together, that's going to come back to bite you one day. Well, again, as a teenager, you can imagine how much I cared about that advice in that moment. <laughs> it came back to bite me, all right. I got to college, first semester of college, oh my goodness. All that not trying, whew. I got grades I had never seen before. My parents were like, what happened? I'm like, I don't know. College is hard. <laughs> it's way harder than high school. I think about a convers- uh, several conversations with, uh, with, with Rachel, who leads our City North Kids team. Rachel, uh, Rachel and her husband, Kyle, are two of, of my closest friends at this point in my life because she in particular, she served on our directional team for a number of years and has worked very closely with me for a long time. She's called me probably six or eight times over the years to be like, hey, you did this thing and it really hurt. I, I, it's not okay. I'm like, okay. Well, you know why our trust is so good now? Because she was willing to put our friendship on the line because she cared about me. I think about my closest friends in my life today. They're all people, all, who are willing to say things to me that I don't want to hear, who are willing to wound me because I can't grow if I can't see my blind spots. 
Wounds from a friend can be trusted. We think of wounds as the worst outcome, but the truth is that not being wounded when I need to be is the worst outcome. Wounds from a friend can be trusted. The second half of the verse, but an enemy multiplies kisses. An enemy multiplies kisses. According to Proverbs, someone who only tells me what I want to hear is my enemy. Why? Because unhealthy conflict starves trust and growth. So healthy conflict fuels trust and growth. Unhealthy conflict, being an aggressor, being a defender, or being an avoider, it starves trust and growth. An enemy multiplies kisses. Attacking, defending, or avoiding, they all yield the same results. They're going to starve trust and growth. It's like putting a Band-Aid on a bullet wound. I've always loved that analogy. I don't know where I heard it the first time, but you put a Band-Aid on a bullet wound, it might look a little bit better from the outside, but the truth is there's no reality in which that thing heals properly. The relationships in my life that have gone south are not the ones where someone who I love has confronted me. They're the ones where people that I love have either been unwilling to come to me or I've been unwilling to go to them. Those are the ones that get destroyed. And my guess is if you think about your own life, if you really think hard, my suspicion is that a lot of those same things would hold true. The people who you end up the closest with over time are not the people who blow smoke up your butt. Sorry for the picture, but that's kind of what I, just, that's just what comes to my mind. They're not the people who are just going to tell you what you want to hear and pretend you're great when you're not. The other thing that I would call this is the American Idol Syndrome. Did I talk about that last week? I might have talked about that last week, American Idol Syndrome. Um, like, if you watch American Idol, there's a lot of people on there that somebody needed to tell you cannot sing and you should stop, right? <laughs> somebody sometime in their life needed to say, you, let's, let's funnel you a different direction. It's not, it's not your gift. <laughs> um, if, you, if you love somebody, there's gonna come a point in time where you've gotta say something to them that they aren't gonna like. It's gonna wound them. That's going to hurt. But those wounds can be trusted. Those wounds you can assume this person, because I know they love me, they are saying this for my good, not for theirs. Just like Jethro did with Moses. I talked about trust, and I, you've probably heard kind of the theme of trust uh, being built out a bit here. If you're willing to wound me, there's, an under, there, there's a dynamic that's happening that isn't the most obvious at, at a cursory look, which is that if you wound me, you're willing to put our friendship on the line, and you're willing to create a scenario where there could be negative repercussions for you. Right? If we're friends, let's flip it around. If we're friends and I come to you and I say, hey, what you're doing, I'm going to use Jethro's words, what you're doing is not good. Here's what you need to be doing. What I've said at this point is, I don't, I care about you enough to be willing to put this friendship on the line. If you don't respond well to this, it could cost me. It could cost me a friendship that matters. But I care about you enough to potentially hurt me for your good. And that's why I say that healthy conflict fuels trust and growth. Because when you know somebody cares about you enough that they will potentially wound and hurt themselves or cost themselves something because of how much they care about you, that's a person you know that you can hang your trust on. Does that make sense? We don't tend to think about it in these terms. We tend to think, well, somebody that's going to wound me is somebody I shouldn't trust. Now, to be clear, that might be true. Internal motivations do matter a lot here. That's kind of another message for another day. But if it's somebody who's wounding just to wound, yeah, probably don't trust them. But if there's somebody you know who loves you, who cares about you, who you know cares about you, who you know cares about your family, who you know cares about, uh, who you know cares about your life, like you've seen it, 
If they say something hard to you that wounds you, the default response typically people have is to go, that's bad. But what if it's just like a doctor cutting open an arm to reset a bone? What if it's like pruning a plant so that the fruit can grow stronger? What if that wound is actually a good wound? When somebody doesn't say what needs to be said when I need to be held accountable, it means they care more about how our relationship benefits them than about my health and growth. And ultimately it means, listen, for avoiders, this is gonna be hard. Ultimately, avoiders particularly, you've gotta be very cautious That in saying, well, I don't want to create conflict, what you're not actually saying is, well, I don't care about that person enough to help them when they need it. Because ultimately, my desire to protect my own pain is, well, that's about me. It it isn't about them. It's about me. So here's the thing. Conflict is necessary. It's necessary for the most growth and the deepest trust in any relationship. I think the Bible lays that out. I could have used a lot of other examples, but I think that we see it in in the example of Jethro and Moses. Jethro didn't need to go to Moses, but he did because he cared about Moses. He cared about Moses' leadership. He cared about the nation of Israel who Moses was leading. And so Jethro went to him and created conflict around a thing that didn't benefit him one bit. And I believe, again, I'm reading between the lines. I know that, but I believe it's because Jethro believed this principle is true. That wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. Jethro knew that the best way to show Moses he loved him was to say, hey, you've got a blind spot. You can't see this thing that's happening that I can very clearly see. And I want you to know for your own good, for your health, for your growth, for your benefit. So conflict is necessary for the most growth and the deepest trust in any relationship. So how do we, how do, we do it? How do, how do we actually, in reality, have healthy conflict? We're gonna to look to, uh, to a little bit more scripture. From Ephesians chapter four, I used part of this scripture again last week. What you're gonna find throughout this series, there's gonna be some commonalities in some of the scripture that we use. We're gonna look at Ephesians 4, and in Ephesians 4, a guy named Paul is writing this letter to a bunch of Christians to tell them, here's how you live this faith thing out day in and day out. And in this particular section of the letter, he writes this. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. So put off falsehood, speak truth to your neighbor, for we're all members of one body. Quick caveat on this. Paul is very obviously, if you understand the way the New Testament works, and and maybe you've heard me talk about this before, Paul, when he talks about we're members of one body, he's talking about the church, believers, the body of Christ. So Paul is very specifically writing to Christians in their interactions with other Christians here. However, that doesn't negate the principles that Paul is writing in the way that we relate to anybody. The way that we interact with Christians is like a command of God but we should be giving that same love and that same grace that Paul writes about to others too. So Paul says, put off falsehood and speak truthfully. And then in verse 26, he says, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry and do not give the devil a foothold. Now there's some interesting things going on here grammatically. I think there's a little bit of a process that Paul's getting at that isn't the most obvious when we read it in English. But Paul kind of identifies three steps that I think are crucial for healthy conflict uh, management resolution. The first step, he says, in your anger, do not sin. So Paul starts off by saying, the first thing you've got to do is check your heart. First thing, check your heart. If you want healthy conflict management and resolution in your life, the very first step in any scenario is check your heart. Check your heart, check your heart, check your heart, check your heart. In your anger, don't sin. In other words, what Paul is saying, and I want to be very clear here, he's not saying anger is bad. He's not saying anger is wrong. It's not. It's an emotion. It's neutral. God put anger inside of us. God put sadness inside of us. God put emotions in us for a reason. 
If you're a person who gets angry by nature, do you know what that is? That's a really, really, really good low fuel light. It's a really good indicator. If you start to feel a lot of anger and you're a person that tends to struggle with anger, if you start to feel anger, it's an indicator something's not right. It's an indicator that you need to look at something. You need to pay attention. I'm a person who like, anger's kind of my like, if you're gonna back me in a corner, I'm not, I'm not gonna tuck my tail. Like, it's just not me. I understand getting angry. <laughs> When I get angry, I have learned that when I, when I get angry, it's a time that I need to go, wait a minute, pause. What's going on here? Because if I'm bad, some, there's something, something that I'm not even maybe aware of yet is going on and I need to pay attention. I need to figure out how to navigate that. So first, check your heart. Make sure your heart is right. Strong emotions are not bad or wrong, but what we do with them can be. So pray. Like that, check your heart, pray. Pray a lot. If you're a person that struggles with anger, pray a lot. Pray till your anger's gone. You know why? Because <laughs> when we're mad, we can't think. Do you know that? There's actually some science behind that. It's really fascinating, but some brain research on the way that our chemicals work. When we're angry, we don't think. So check your heart, pray. Another great thing that you can do if, if, if you're struggling to check your heart, if you aren't sure that how you're feeling about a situation is the right way, talk to a trusted brother or sister in Christ. Talk to a pastor. Talk to a small group leader. Talk to just a friend. Talk to a counselor if you have a counselor. Talk to somebody who, like Jethro, can give perspective who can stand back from the situation without being emotionally invested and critically who, if you need it, will wound you. Who, if you need it, will look you in the face and say, you're way off here. The way you're thinking and feeling about this isn't okay. Like, you're the one with the issue. And you need to work on that. Or, who, if you're not the one with the issue, if it's very clear that the other person's the one with the issue, you need somebody who will look you in the face and say, I think the way you're feeling is valid, but be careful. You still have to deal with it in the right way. That person still matters. And no matter what they've done to you, they're still, they're still just a person like you who needs grace and love and mercy. So check your heart. Check your heart. We need a heart of restoration, a heart of growth. A heart for the other, a heart not for ourselves. And crucially, our heart can't be dependent on their response. Because the second step is to confront in love. Confront with in, I don't remember how I wrote it. Confront with love. Step one, check your heart. Step two, confront with love. You gotta be careful. You have to know here what your default is. If you're gonna confront, you have to know, am I an attacker? Am I a defender? Am I an avoider? because our default is gonna naturally try to come out, right? Our default is gonna naturally try to come out. If I'm an attacker, I need to know, which but I am, by the way, that's mine. <laughs> I need to know that if I'm an attacker by nature, I have to enter into that confrontation with a lot of the Holy Spirit in me <laughs> so that I don't bowl somebody over, whether intentionally or unintentionally. Because I know that when that side of me comes out, there is no love in confrontation. If I'm a defender and somebody, if somebody approaches me and, and I'm a defender, I need to know that defending myself and defending my own position doesn't bring us together. It drives a wedge between us. And so I need to value what the other person is saying. I need to value their perspective. I need to value and I need to try to understand them. And if I'm an avoider, you just got to do it. Paul writes, in your anger, do not sin. And then he writes, do not let the sun go down on your anger. For avoiders, our greatest temptation in life and in conflict and in relationships is to let the sun go down on our anger. We just would rather not deal with it. But if you're an avoider and we were sitting down having a meal together right now and we were just chatting and 
I said, tell me about your avoiding. And immediately you would start to avoid, right? <laughs> I'm not talking about that. <laughs> tell me about your avoiding. Let me ask you a question. How many times has avoiding turned out like, yeah, that was the right call? You know, that relationship, it's just like, it got better. It worked out really, really well in the end. No, right? Some of you are chuckling because you're like, yeah, I know. How many times has that relationship ended up in a world of hurt? Because the problem that you thought was really small wasn't really small. And you avoided that problem. Then you avoided the bigger problem, then the bigger problem, then the bigger. And by the end, you ended up with a gap between you and that person that was so wide you could never close it. Now, I'm a confronter by nature, but in certain situations, I'm not. The first staff member I ever had at City North was a guy named Mark Tenney. Uh, he was on staff with us for the first like nine months of the church. Uh, he was a music guy, which was great because I didn't have to do all this stuff. Um, Mark was a friend of mine from college, and I made a colossal mistake with Mark. I didn't deal with small aggravations and frustrations in the early days. And I thought, it'll be fine. It'll get better. It'll work out. It did not and by the time I realized how frustrated I was, I had let those small frustrations build to the point that there, there, it just it wasn't going to work. And I went into a meeting where I tried with everything in me to love him well and lay out like, hey, there's, there's a bunch of problems, man. We got to work on them. But you know what I did? I went in there and told him he was a terrible employee. I, that's not what I said. That's what he heard. Because I had a laundry list of stuff that needed to change that I didn't deal with in the early days. And as you might imagine, not that long after, he resigned. Because when we avoid, we make everything bigger. So check your heart, confront in love. And then the third step, check your heart. See, I just kind of brought that full circle. Check your heart, confront in love, check your heart. Paul says, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And then he says, do not give the devil a foothold. So once you've confronted, this is the thing that a lot of people miss. Once you've confronted, there's a whole other step of checking your heart after that. Here's why. Their response will present opportunities for things to go wrong again. If the person that you confront responds negatively, that's the easy one to identify, right? Now we've got the potential for bitterness and for anger to grow, right? They didn't value me. They didn't, val they didn't care what I said. They blew me off. It didn't matter to them. Now, now, now I'm becoming bitter and angry about that. Well, now I've got a whole other problem. But the more hidden one that's harder to see is what happens if that person responds really well? Do you know what has the potential to grow then? Pride and arrogance. Ah, look, I was right and they were wrong. This worked out well. The second that begins to take root in our hearts, that's almost the more dangerous scenario. Check your heart, confront with love, check your heart. Conflict is inevitable. But if we do it by checking our hearts, confronting with love and checking our hearts, it can get healthy. It can. There is, again, one quick caveat I've got to mention here. You could have the healthiest way of dealing with conflict on earth, but if the other person is unhealthy and is unable to deal with conflict in a healthy way, you might find that that doesn't go well you will find that that doesn't go well at times. And when it doesn't go well, I do think, by the way, that it is appropriate uh, and acceptable to establish boundaries. We're talking about that in two weeks. Because sometimes you have to set boundaries for your own health. And so I do want to be very clear that like, if you've got somebody in your life, let's say, who's, who's inflicted a lot of hurt and a lot of wounds on you, and you know because of the evidence that you have that if you go talk to them, it's going to go very poorly and it's going to negatively affect your own mental and emotional health at this point in your life, then don't go confront them today. That would be stupid and foolish. <laughs> don't do that. Don't do that. Be wise. There are ways to set boundaries. Again, we're going to talk about that in two weeks. The boundaries are healthy. They're good. They're appropriate. When wounding continues to happen 
and when there is no reciprocal heart of love back. But if you have somebody in your life who has wounded you, who has hurt you, if you have somebody in your life who you have struggled with getting on the same page, and there's just been conflict and conflict and conflict, and, and, and maybe I'm sitting here, or you're sitting here right now thinking, yeah, I know who that person is, but you know they love you, you know they care about you, but you just, it just, it's never, there's always something. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Have a conversation. Check your heart, but then confront with love, with a heart of restoration, a heart for them, not for you. And what you will find if you'll put that into place in your life, if every time there's a situation where there's conflict, where there's difficulty, where somebody's wounded you, check your heart and then confront it and then check your heart. If somebody comes to you, check your heart. By the way, this is largely geared at having those conversations. Same pattern in reverse. If somebody comes to you, check your heart in real time in that moment. (laughs) Check your heart and now deal with the confrontation in love and then check your heart on the back end. It's the same pattern. If you'll do that, I'm not telling you this because, well, I think the Bible says it. I mean, it does, but I'm I'm telling you this because I've walked this out in my life. You can end up having relationships that are very full, that are strong, that are rich, that have life, where the trust that you have with that person is maybe unlike anything you've ever experienced before because you know they have your back in a way that goes far beyond somebody who's unwilling to say what needs to be said. Conflict is inevitable, but it's what we do with it that makes all the difference. The scriptures teach us, and anecdotally, the evidence is everywhere, that healthy conflict fuels trust and growth, but unhealthy conflict starves it. And so for all of us, if today we could take one step in our relationships I would encourage you to take a step toward health in your conflict. Deal with that problem. Deal with that thing. Have that conversation and begin to bring healing and restoration. Let me pray for us.